Okay, Doc, so uh, another study we are going to look at is uh, Bocciaro et al. Uh, Bocciaro is the name. Um, so this was done in 2012, um, and it is about something called whistleblowing and, um, and disobedience. So whistleblowing is something that you often see in the news. Um, so when you blow the whistle it is about seeing something that's unjust or unethical um and you sort of go to um somebody in a position of of power to tell them what's going on basically um so it happens quite often in the military you know when you see um things like um military officials giving unjust orders or behaving in an immoral way towards um other people in the military or to um, civilians, if you then went to go and report to um, somebody who's quite senior in the military or even to the media um, about what's going on there, that is known as whistleblowing. Okay, so it's quite famous because you've got people like Edward Snowden who've done it. Um, but as we've seen from cases like Edward Snowden, there are um, consequences to whistleblowing. So what this study is doing is it's looking at whether people will disobey in a situation and also whether people are going to blow the whistle in a situation, to whether they're going to alert somebody to the fact that something unjust and immoral is happening. Okay, so um, social power um, refers to the influence an individual has to change another's thoughts, feelings or behaviours. Um, so individuals in authority, whether it's legitimate or illegitimate authority, have social power. So anybody who is in some kind of authority position, whether it's an actual authority position like a policeman um, or a teacher, or it's somebody who expresses that they have authority over you, um, so like more like an illegitimate authority figure, it hires their, it like increases their social status. Um, increases their place in the hierarchy and lowers yours um so it means that i can influence you more because i've got power and you don't have power so you're more likely to do what i say so people have strong inclinations to obey legitimate authority figures irrespective of their beliefs okay so we've talked about obedience in some other studies before so things like milgram have shown that people will obey um when being asked to do something that's that's immoral and that goes against what they believe is right and wrong and um, but then milgram study didn't explain disobedience um to unjust authority so it didn't it acknowledged that not everybody in milgram study obeyed um but it didn't talk about why or look at why it only focused on those who obeyed so disobedience and defiance to Unjust authority is a precondition for social progress. So, in other words, if there aren't people who will challenge the unjust things that are happening in the world, then society is never going to change for the better. So if you think about things like um, slavery and the, the, the movements when it comes to slavery or feminism so society has been a certain way in which it's treating a certain group of people or certain people unjustly um, and only when people have disobeyed um, and gone against that movement has society been able to, to progress and to change for the better Okay, so as well as being disobedient, another option is to report the wrongdoing to higher authorities, which is known as the whistleblowing. Okay, so you can either obey somebody, you can disobey somebody, or you can blow the whistle. So when it comes to blowing the whistle, it doesn't matter whether you've obeyed or disobeyed in that moment. But if you actually then go and tell somebody, that's blowing the whistle. So you could obey somebody, but then blow the whistle as well. Okay. Now, in most situations, um, when it comes to uh, defiant behaviours, so disobeying, you would expect that people 
aren't very likely to blow the whistle. So even if you think you're going to disobey, or even if you do disobey, it's usually unlikely that you're going to blow the whistle because when when you're actually blowing the whistle, it means that you are putting yourself in a very awkward position because you are confronting um, the defiant person, you're confronting authority, you're going against perhaps the norms of a society or the norms of a profession. Um, so like it, in the example that we've talked about with the military, it is the norm that whatever your commanding officer tells you to do, you do. So if you then challenge that and go to another authority figure and say, well, I'm not doing that because that's unjust, that's not right, you're actually going against everything that you've kind of been taught. Even though what you're doing is morally correct, you're going against authority and you're confronting authority. So that can be quite a difficult thing for people to do. Therefore, we don't expect that people will blow the whistle very often. So what we want to know is... Who are the kinds of people that will disobey and blow the whistle rather than obey? And why do they choose that moral path? Why do they go and blow the whistle? And do they have any like personal characteristics which differentiate them from those who obey? So is there anything that's qualitatively different or personally different about the kind of person who's going to blow the whistle and report unjust actions or who's going to challenge the authority figure and say no? I'm not going to do that compared to the kind of person who will just obey. Okay, so that's what this study is, is wanting to look at. So this study is aiming to uh, use a generic Milgram paradigm. So a paradigm is basically like, um, like a, a concept set of ideas. So the Milgram paradigm is, is studying um, how somebody responds to a figure of authority, so if they will obey, disobey, whatever. So they're using that paradigm as a starting point. So the authority figure is going to request something immoral of the participant, but as well as giving them the option to obey and disobey, as they had in Milgram, they're going to provide them with the option to take personal action against this unjust system. So they're going to give them the chance to obey and disobey, just like Milgram, but they're also going to give them the chance to blow the whistle. So it was different to Milgram's study in that sense, but also it's different because it's aiming to be personally engaging, to have mundane realism, and to not cause any psychological harm. So it's aiming to be ethical. Okay. Um, so as I explained, so a paradigm is a model or pattern for doing something. So um, in science, it means a set of standardised procedures to manipulate behaviour um, in order to make it objective, reliable, replicable. Um, so in this sense, it's I've got this standardised set of procedures where I've got the authority figure, I've got the participant, the authority figure is going to do this, they're going to try and persuade them to do something immoral, um, and I'm going to observe the behaviour and the consequences. Now, you often see paradigms when it comes to experiments and things, but uh, this isn't strictly an experiment. Some people have referred to it, just like Milgram, as an experiment, but it isn't really. Okay. So hypotheses. So they had four hypotheses. So they think in this study, Bocciaro et al., that participants will be more obedient than those in Milgram because actually in this one, they're not being asked to do anything physically aggressive. So they think people are going to obey more. Participants are going to be less likely to blow the whistle than obey because of this direct contact and conflict um, with the higher authority. That we've talked about. Participants will overestimate the tendency to disobey and blow the whistle. So I'm more likely to say, yeah, I'll blow the whistle than I actually am um, to blow the whistle. Um, and personality characteristics will not have much of an effect on whether a person obeys, disobeys, or blows the whistle. Okay. Um, so the method... So, like Milgram, there's no independent variable, it's a controlled observation. And we've got three DVs here. So, the DVs are obedience, disobedience, and whistleblowing. Okay. So, it's taking place in Amsterdam, so VU University in Amsterdam, where it was done in a lab. So, it's highly controlled, standardised. Um, 
the experimenter authority behaviour was standardised, the cover story was consistent. Um, we have two rooms that we used for this study, which was prepared specifically for the study. The timings were kept the same for all participants, so loads of things were standardised and controlled here. Okay, so fairly straightforward so far, uh, but now it gets a little bit more complicated in the sense that there's a few things that happen in this study. Okay, so you've got three um, different groups of people in this study. So the first group that we're going to talk about is your sample. Okay, so you've got the main sample of participants. So these are the people who actually take part in Bocciaro's study of obedience, disobedience and whistleblowing. So there's 149 Dutch undergraduate students, there's 96 women, 53 men, the mean age is 20.8 and the standard deviation of that is 2.65. Um, they took part in the study and they were given either 7 euros or course credit. So course credit is something that you collect at your time in university, uh, particularly if you do certain degrees. So um, when you do a psychology degree, you've got to collect so many course credits within your first year. Um, and that means that you end up participating in lots of different bits of research because you have to collect those course credits um, and you get you can get given so many course credits per study that you do. OK, um, now a total of 11 participants were removed from the initial sample of 160 because of their suspiciousness about the nature of the study. Okay, so they had, um, they were recruited, I think they had a poster in the university uh, cafeteria um, and they um, self-selected to take part for the seven euros off the course credit um, and you've got 160 people who volunteer. Now, 11 of these appear suspicious about the aims of the study. Now, what we don't want is to see demand characteristics or social desirability bias in this study. So because they are suspicious about the aims, we think we're likely to see demand characteristics. So we're going to remove those 11. So we've just got 149 people now. OK, so that's the sample who take part in the study. Now, before we go on to do this study, We've got some pilot tests. So 92 University of Amsterdam students take part in a pilot test. So a pilot test is uh, like a small scale version of a study that occurs before the study takes place. Now, this was necessary for the board to approve the study at the University of Amsterdam. So... The reasons that they do this are to check that the procedure is believable, the procedure is morally acceptable, so it's ethical, and to make sure that everything's standardised, like the experimenter's authority behaviour. Okay, so the 92 students took part in this and they made comments, qualitative comments that were discussed. So there was things like them saying it's cool and interesting and it's good for science. Okay, so if this was necessary for the uh, Institutional Review Board to approve the project. So they wouldn't let the study go ahead until we'd seen a pilot study that proved it was believable, ethical, standardised, controlled, those things. OK, and also the participants had to give informed consent. Uh, participants had to have the right to withdraw. Uh, we had to reassure them, that, reassure them that it was confidential tell them of any risks of taking part. So again, this is something that is needed for the study to be approved. Okay. And then the other group of people that we've got is we've got 138 comparison students who take part in an initial survey to predict how people would behave in that scenario. So what these 138 students are being um, told is that there is um, this study that's going on, this is what they're being asked to do, um, and then they're being asked to rate whether, or say rather, whether they would obey, disobey, or whistleblow, and also what would the average student do? So what would you do, and what would the average student do? Would they obey, disobey, or whistleblow? 
Okay, so you've got your three groups of people. So the first thing that happens is your pilot study. So you've got your 92 students taking part in a pilot study to make sure that this um, piece of research is approved to go ahead. You've got 138 comparison students who are being asked, this is what's going to happen in the study. What would you do? And what would the average student do? And then you've got 149 Dutch undergraduate students who are taking part in the study. OK, so we're going to talk about these 149 Dutch undergraduate students taking part in the study, what they were asked to do um, and the materials that they're given. OK, so we'll talk about the materials first. So there is a research committee ethics form. There's two personality tests. Um, and we're going to talk about what those personality tests are. So. What essentially happens in this research is they're told about a piece of research that's going to go ahead and then they have to sign this form. And this form basically says that this research is ethical or unethical. Um, and then they post this in an anonymous box um, and this is then sent to the um, committee that will approve the research. That's what the participants are being told. Um, so they're going to essentially decide whether this research gets to go ahead or not by saying, yes, it's ethical or no, it's unethical. So they're given that form. They're given two personality tests. So the first one is the Hexaco PIR. OK, so the Hexaco PIR assesses six basic personality traits. So honesty, humility, emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness to experience so what this looks like is it's got 60 statements on and then you've got a like at scale in which you um have to say whether you strongly disagree to strongly agree with that statement so it might be um one that assesses um emotionality maybe so it might say um I feel upset if people don't like me. That might be the statement. And then you have to rate from one to five whether you strongly disagree to strongly agree. OK, and then you work out a score. So you end up, there's 10 questions because there's 60 statements for each personality um, trait. So you end up with a score for honesty, humility, emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness. And it kind of tells you what you like as a person. OK, uh, and then the second personality test is the decomposed games measure. So this is a nine item test which assesses how much importance a person places on the welfare of another person and the welfare of themselves. So the researchers use this because the paradigm that they're using um, creates a dilemma in which you're, you've got a clash between self-interest and collective interest. So they're asking you to do something. And if you do it, then you're kind of like, well, it's a bit of self-interest because I've come, I've got the money, I've got my course credit, whatever it is, and I'm getting out of confronting them. So even though I don't really agree with it, I don't want to confront them. So that's my self-interest. So I'm just going to do it. But then if you do do it, you're going against collective interest. So it's going to end up harming somebody else in the future. But you don't know who. Um, or you might know who, but it's going to end up harming them. So it's sort of clashing self-interest and collective interest. So this is what this test measures. So in this test, um, the decomposed games measure, you get nine items and participants are asked to imagine that they're randomly paired with another person. So this person is called the other. The other isn't somebody that you know. It's not somebody that you're ever going to meet. And you've got nine choices. And in each choice, you have to assign points to you and you assign points to the other. Now, you don't know what these points are for, but it's points. So obviously points are usually for something. So if we look at this, so this might be... Um, Item number one out of nine. So in this example, if you choose option A, you get 500 points and the other gets 100 points. If you choose option B, 
Uh, you both get 500 points. If you choose option C, you get 550 and the other gets 300. Okay, so we're going to have a go at some of these in lesson um, and we'll sort of talk more about what that means. But it's essentially looking at how much value you, you place on your own interests and your own welfare and how much value you place on other people's. Okay, so what happens is um, the participant reports to a lab. They are greeted by um, a male um, Dutch experimenter who um, is formally dressed as the man in the picture is, and he has a stern manner. Okay, so what this experimenter does is he asks for a list of um, students who are your friends. Okay, so you present this list. Then um, each participant is um, read a detailed transcript. So I'll read you the full thing in lesson, but essentially what it says is the research that we're going to do today is on sensory deprivation. So the, the Dutch male experimenter is reading this. It's on sensory deprivation. Um, previous participants thought this experience was frightening. Uh, we need college students to take part um, and the university research committee is evaluating whether to approve our study or not. So it would help us if you could convince those students that you've named to take part. And it would also help us if you could convince the research committee that our study is ethical. So these are the two things that you're being asked to do. So you've given us a list of your friends, so you need to convince them to take part. And also, we've not been approved to do this research yet, so you're going to help us convince the research committee that it's ethical so that the study can go ahead. Even though it's frightening and it's on sensory deprivation, which is unethical. Sensory deprivation has actually been used as a torture method. Okay, so the experimenter then leaves the room for three minutes to allow the participants to reflect. So then after three minutes, he comes back and he says, uh, we'll now move to the next room where you can fill in the statements for your friends uh, and the form for the research committee. You must be enthusiastic when you're writing your statement. Please use at least two of the following words, either exciting, incredible, great or superb. And please do not mention the negative effects of sensory deprivation. So when you're being asked to convince your friends, what you're doing is you're writing a report to them about the research and they're asking you that you need to say it's exciting, incredible, great or superb and you're not allowed to say that it's negative so don't mention that it's frightening, basically. Okay, so after we said this to them, the participants led to the second room. Now in the second room, um, there's a computer where they're going to write that report to their fellow students and there's the research committee form to say whether it's ethical or unethical and the experimenter leaves them alone in the room for seven minutes and then after they've written that report and they've posted that ethics form they fill in the two personality tests okay so the whole thing lasts about 40 minutes for each participant okay so They're being asked to write this report to their friends, okay? So they've got the computer where they're writing the report to fellow students to say it was, um, you know, it was exciting, it was incredible, it was great, it was superb. And when they're not allowed to mention that sensory deprivation is negative. So what that part of the study is testing is obedience. So if you write that report to your friends, you obey. If you refuse to write that report to your friends, you disobey. OK, and then if you've got this uh, research committee form where you've got to say whether it's ethical or unethical and there's a mailbox where you anonymously post that. If you say that it's unethical on this form, what you are doing is you are alerting that higher authority, the research committee form, that actually there's something unethical going on here. This is immoral. And so you are blowing the whistle, okay? So what is testing disobedience or an obedience is whether you, obedience would be if you uh, wrote the report to your friends using at least two of those words, exciting, incredible, superb, great. Um, disobedience would be if you didn't write the report and didn't use the words 
And whistleblowing is if you alert the research committee um, that the research is unethical by use of the anonymously posted form. Okay, and then research comes back, you take the two personality tests, your hexaco PIR, and you decompose games measure. Then participants are carefully debriefed to make sure they understand the true nature of the study. Um, this is important because we don't want them to lose trust in research to so say that they've felt that they've been pressured into getting their friends to take part in sensory deprivation. We don't want to stop them from coming back to do other research in the future. Um, and then during the debrief, the comments that participants made about the study and about how they felt are counted as qualitative data. OK, so we've got the quantitative and the qualitative data to look at. So those who wrote the recommendation were obedient, those who refused were disobedient, and those who reported the experiment to the research committee were the whistleblowers. Now, the whistleblowers get divided again into open and anonymous whistleblowers. So open whistleblowers are people who reported it, um, but also refused to write the report to their friends. So if they said, I'm not writing this report, and then went on to say it was unethical, they're an open whistleblower. If they wrote the report, but then blew the whistle, they're an anonymous whistleblower. So they've avoided the confrontation, but they've still blown the whistle. Okay. So in the... Um, these are the results here from the comparison groups, the 138 comparison students predicting behaviour. So when they're predicting their own behaviour, only 3.6% of them predicted that they would obey, 31.9% uh, predicted they would disobey, and the most predicted they would blow the whistle. Now, when they are predicting other people's behaviour, you can see it's come out differently. So they're still predicting the fewest people to obey, but they're predicting that most people will just disobey and fewer people will blow the whistle. Okay, so that's that's just over half the amount of people who said they blow the whistle before. So you can see there that people in the comparison group have predicted that, that they're probably like more moral and they'll be better and perform better than the average person. And we'll come back to that. And you can also see here that um, in the actual experiment, so like he's referring to it as an experiment, but remember it's an observation, um, but those who actually took part in the study, most of them obeyed, so 76.5%, um, which is higher than Milgram, as they believed. So most of them obeyed. Um, 14.1% disobeyed and 9.4% blew the whistle. Now, among these whistleblowers, 6% uh, were anonymous. So they wrote the report to their friends, but then blew the whistle on the form. And 3.4% were open. So fewer of the whistleblowers were open. Okay. Um, and that's just a sort of table to, to demonstrate that. Okay, um, so the quantitative data, so there was no significant difference um, between the groups when it came to the personality tests. Okay, so between those who obeyed, disobeyed and blew the whistle, uh, we didn't find any significant difference between genders or religious affiliations, so which religion they are, or even if they're involved in religion, so if they go to church all the time. Um, However, there was a significant difference found for faith. So faith isn't the same as religion. Faith is a confident belief in a transcendent reality. So a belief in sort of something greater than just daily humanity and daily life. So even if you believe in sort of like an afterlife or a greater power or a greater being, even if that's not a God, that's some kind of faith. Um, but the effect was so small that it's more like a trend. It's not a significant, um, it's it's sort of, it's kind of like it's significant, but it's, it's only just realistically significant. So it's more like a trend that whistleblowers have more faith um, compared to the other groups. But then there was no significant differences between the personality types. Um, and when it came to the decomposed games measure, um, 
they found that pro-social and individualistic um, ratings were not unequally distributed between the three groups. So in other words, there wasn't one group that had more pro-social people in. So you wouldn't find that the whistleblowers are really pro-social because there was pro-social people across all groups. And you wouldn't find that people who are obedient or individualistic because they were also across all groups. Okay, um, and then you've got qualitative data. So from the study, um, in the debrief, they're collecting the comments and they found that there was qualitative differences between these who obeyed and who disobeyed. So people who obeyed were saying things like, it was because of external forces that they obeyed. So it was expected of me, that's why I continued. I cooperated because the experimenter asked me to do so. Um, so they were kind of like in this agentic state almost that Milgram had described in his study as well. But then when it came to the disobedient participants, they were showing more of a personal responsibility. So they weren't in this agentic state at all. They were saying things like, I'd be disappointed in myself. I don't want to do these unethical things. I disobeyed. I feel responsible for my friends. Um, the experiment would really hurt people and I don't want to be responsible for that. OK, so when it comes to the data, you've got a bit to remember there. So you've got this table. So you need to be able to remember the things about the predictions. So remember some of this data and um, remember the actual behaviour. And also, also, obviously, the difference between your open and anonymous whistleblowers. Um, remember the personality differences. And also, I'd remember at least a quote from an obedient person and a quote from a disobedient person for the qualitative data. Okay, so uh, this study concludes that um, we can cast some kind of doubt on the use of imagined scenario research. So people are very poor at predicting behaviour. So when we looked at the comparisons of um, how people predict that they would behave and how people actually end up behaving so like for example um the comparison group predicted that only 3.6 of them would obey and only 18.8 percent of normal students would obey when in actual fact 76.5 percent obeyed um and then they predicted that 64 percent of them would whistleblow and 37.7 percent of um, normal students would whistleblow, but actually only 9.4 did. So what we're suggesting is that we shouldn't really use research where we're asking people to predict their behaviour because people generally are very inaccurate at doing so. You wouldn't imagine that if we were accurate, there would be such big differences between what you predict would happen and what actually happened. Also, what the comparison group said um, lend support to the better than average phenomenon. So this is the idea that everyone believes themselves to be better than the average person on various attributes. So that's why only 3.6% of people said that they would obey. But then when it came to estimating how many normal people, normal students would obey, they said 18.8%. And also why when it came to whistleblowing, they said most of them said that they would blow the whistle 64.6 percent said i'd blow the whistle and then again thinking about the normal people they said a much smaller amount so only 37.3 percent are going to blow the whistle so people generally believe that they're better than the average person and these figures like particularly the low figures of whistleblowing so the fact that only 9.4 percent of people blew the whistle show that whistleblowing is difficult and that these situational pressures can have a massive effect on whether somebody obeys or disobeys or does blow the whistle. Okay. Um, and these situational pressures are evident in that qualitative data as well. So it was expected of me um, and like the experimenter had, had expected me to do it, things like that. So that's a situational pressure, which means you're more likely to, to obey. OK, so again, there's your reference. So I'll give you a chance to have a go at writing that reference. Uh, so it's done by Bocciaro, Zimbardo and Van Land. And there you go, there's your reference. 
Okay, so just like in all the other videos, um, I'll just run through some evaluation points um, really quickly. Um, so there is um, the fact that it's done in a lab setting. So um, it's controlled, standardised, uh, reliable because we can repeat it, um, things like that. Um, standardised, um, so reduces EVs. It's a volunteer sample, so you're less likely to see attrition because people want to take part. Um, it's got quantitative and qualitative data, so we've got easy comparisons, statistical analysis, but also insight into why people behaved in that way because people were giving reasons, so I feel responsible or I was being told to do so. Um, and it's ethical, much more ethical than other studies into obedience. So we've got informed consent, we've got the right to withdraw, we have been um, debriefed, it is confidential, we've been protected from harm because it's a much more ethical study anyway, we're not actually doing anything to anybody and also we've been fully debriefed to make sure that they understand the aims of this study, therefore that's also protecting them from psychological harm because they know now that even if they've written that recommendation it's not going anywhere. Okay. Um, but because it's in this lab setting, low ecological validity, it's done only in um, with Dutch students in a Dutch university. Uh, therefore, we can say because it's looking at one um, group of people at one time, um, it's ethnocentric. It could be biased because it's a volunteer sample. Um, they're likely to have characteristics in similar, so we're going to have some... Um, Volunteer bias as well. Um, what about student samples? Um, they might be more susceptible to demand characteristics if you're a student because you've got more of an inquisitive mind, but also maybe more likely to obey. Um, and it's not completely ethical because there is some element of deception because we've told them it's a study about um, sensory deprivation and that they're going to be getting their friends to be recruited and all that kind of stuff and then they're not actually they think they are but they aren't actually so there's a bit of deception there and also you might feel even though you know that statement's not going anywhere now you might feel stress and you might feel guilt for having told your friends to come and take part when you know it's frightening um so there could be some ethical concerns there okay so um again we're going to evaluate this in a lot more depth in lesson, uh, make sure your notes are up to date. You've got quite thorough notes because uh, I will be checking those in lesson.